It's another day, Visionites, that the Lord has made. We're going to rejoice and really be glad in it. You know, we, we started the series on right versus righteousness. And I knew God was going to take that because there, there's so much that, that interacts with what we're doing today that we have to realize where we stand on a lot of these issues. We talked about, about what, where, what kingdom we're, we're serving. We talked about where our heart was. We, we talked about a lot of things about right versus righteousness. But, but it, it boils down that we live in a society right now that focus on right, which is of the flesh, rather than God's righteousness, which is in the spirit. And this is why we have a lot of challenges that's, that's occurring, not only in this country, but other countries abroad. And it boils down to, we hear the scripture say, we must die daily. Talk about bringing the flesh and the dead into the word, but it seems like the flesh is really, instead of dying, it's just being revitalized. It's just being made even more strong stronger than it ever before. And, and that's what causes a lot of problem here on the earth and in the lives of not just believers, but everyone. It's a selfish type of attitude that people have, and it has to do with a lot of, of the flesh with its power and its wants. Uh, as you know, I've, I've, for the last six months, I've been doing some teaching coming out of the Old Testament. And I said, Lord, you, you put me uh, into the Old Testament when I'm dealing with New Testamental saints. And God said the reason, because he said, my people need to know me, son. They need to know me. David was called a friend of God or something to speak with God because he not only understood God's action, he understood God's ways. And because of that, it, it, you have to spend time. And the Old Testament, it talks about how God interacts with his prophets, with his people, with the nation of Israel, with Abraham, how he directly interacted with them. And, and, and David, he was one of the ones that spent a lot of time understanding and knowing God. This is why the books of Psalms is broken up into various divisions. It's one of the largest books in the Bible. Because and he spoke about the relationship of God, not only his relationship, but God's relationship with his people. And, and it went on and passed on even to his son, Solomon, well, they have wrote the book of Proverbs and, and part of Ecclesiastes. It, it just to bring out some of the wisdom of understanding, knowing God, and understanding how he operates in the lives of his people. One of the challenges that, that as a minister, as a pastor, and, 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 and I even throw out the word theologian, is that it's the study of God. But you have to spend time for the person to study them. To understand them and to and, and when everything's said and done, to actually know them. I know I, I hear a lot of people say, I know the word. Well, if you know the word, you're supposed to know God. Now we know God knows you. But the challenge is, does God's word in you reflect that you really know God? I think about the uh the people who wanted to sit on the right side of God, the Son that's giving so forth and and the people want to operate in the power of God, and, and, and the demons even cried out, this person I know and that person I know, but who are you again? Because there was no light that was emanating from them. And therefore, if there's no light, that means that there's no promises that are manifesting themselves in each and every one of our everyday lives. In this Right versus Righteousness series, and if I, I implore you that if you can... If you could have YouTube or Facebook, go back and catch it from the very beginning. I think we started in the last week of September. Go back and catch this and, and, and see how, through those various teachings, how it impacts your everyday living and, and how it impacts about where you really stand with God. You know, uh, we, 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 we confess this in 1 John 1 and 9. The word said we confess our sins. He's faithful and just to forgive us of our sins. But he also got closed out and said, and to cleanse us. From all unrighteousness. Therefore, when we're in unrighteousness, we're not in right standing with God. But when we're in righteousness, that places us back in right standing with God. Therefore, God's word is being interacted or being, it's being, how you say, activated in our lives. And you ask, well, Lord, I'm waiting on you, waiting on you. But not really. Maybe the word is waiting on you. If Jesus was the word made flesh, 
God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, then where are you in the Trinity? Well, I'm with Jesus. Well, how could you be with Jesus and not be with the Holy Spirit? And how could you be with the Holy Spirit and not be with God? How could you be with God and not be with Jesus? See, it interacts. It's all one. It is all one. I, I, I did a, a, a study, and it was over in the book of Jeremiah. And, and, and I was looking at a nation that was called of God, but did not act like they were called of God. And it was saying how God saw them based on how they were interacting, not with him, but more or less with themselves. And how the leadership forgot not only that God placed them there for a reason and not to be self-serving or self-centered. Now, let me throw this out to you. In your walk with God as a believer, are you more self-serving or self-centered? Either one can be detrimental because see, number one, number one, promotion comes from the Lord. Number two, you're a disciple. Number three, the Bible says the greater of you will become the servant. And those are the challenges you must ask yourself when you're trying to establish your right versus God's righteousness in your life. Over in Jeremiah, I want to see an excerpt here that I was reading here. Over in the 22nd chapter, and, and you have to understand that, that God had been dealing with these evil kings, these people who have been representing God, he, he, the, the nation of Israel that had, had been taken captive, and he was talking with Jeremiah, and he was talking with, with the people, why they angered him, why they, why they were uh, uh, in a state of flux. That means that they didn't know where they were coming and going, all because of their pride, their actions, and the way they carried themselves in the opposite of, uh, direction of following God and operating in God's spirit. Let, let, let's get down to the 22nd, I'm sorry, the 22nd chapter of the book of Jeremiah. Drop down to the 13th verse. For a subtitle in this part 6 of Right versus Righteousness, a subtitle, How Are You Building your spiritual house. Talk about your life. Talk about this person right here. You. How are you building your spiritual house? It's a good question. Because, see, the results are there. The Bible says you can tell the tree by the fruit it bears. The way you build your house is going to determine your blessings coming from above. It dictates it. Owen. Jeremiah 22nd, and I know I'm going to try to complete this today, but it says here, 13th verse, Woe unto him that buildeth his house by unrighteousness. Underline that. Woe unto him that buildeth his house by unrighteousness, and his chambers ruined by wrong that uses his neighbor's service without wages and give him not for his work. To bring clarity to this right here, and, and, and from a different paradigm, I thought it's going to, many paradigms going to come out of this, this particular chapter here, or the, or the end of this chapter here, is that you've got to ask yourself, am I doing what's righteous in God's eyes and, and and maybe trying to get ahead in life or, or trying to provide for my family or, or just everyday living, you know. Or am I doing it on the backs of others, you know, so I can be, have them uh, uh, be more or less my, my, my ladder to success by standing on them, raising their backs. He goes on, he used that term, he says, Woe unto him that built up his house by unrighteousness and his chambers by wrong that useth his neighbor's service without wages. Don't want to give him anything and give up him not for his work. There are a lot of people who want something for nothing. If you're one of those, get out of that. Get out of that spirit. No one owes you anything but to love you. If God speaks to their heart by doing things, that's God that's giving it to you through them. The Bible says, oh, no man, anything. But yet in the 
and still, we want everybody to owe us. If you're either working for the Lord or you're not. Paul made on many occasions, he said, you know, you give it to him, I'll pay. God, when God tells you to do something for others, he said that, because he'll pay. But don't you go out and try to solicit your own things from God, I mean from others. That's being selfish. He says here, verse 14, that saith, I will build me a wide house and a large chamber and cut of him out windows and it is sealed with cedar and painted with vermilion. Verse 15, shalt thou reign because thou clothest thyself in cedar? Did not thy father eat and drink and do judgment and justice? And then it was well with him. Let me read that from Amplified. I want you to understand this. Do you think, this Amplified version of verse 15, do you think that being a king merely means self-indulgence? Vying with Solomon and striving to excel in cedar palaces. That was the best palace in me, that cedar at that time. Did not your father, Josiah, as he ate in cedar palaces, did not your father, Josiah, as he ate and drank, do justice and righteousness, being upright and in right standing with God? Then it was well with him. In other words, he did stuff. Not on the backs of others. Matter of fact, he tried to provide for others. But he did it in a way that it was well pleasing with God. And God rewarded him by allowing him to be in a position of kingship. Being in a position of authority. You know, we're living in a, in a society today that, that you find right now, even, even when we look at some of this stuff right here with people running for various offices, it's all about power. you know, And they'll say anything and do anything to get that power. And they'll deceive many just to get there. And it's based on the spirit of that flesh wanting more. You know, I used to always ask, why would you have multimillionaires wanting jobs that play one, one fourth of what they already have? It's about power. You have some who will serve just to serve. You have philanthropists, they're not looking for a position. They already have a position. Their position is just to give unto others as God would have been given unto them. But the challenge, is that sometimes people can get into positions and, and, and have good intentions, but something about that flesh, if that flesh is not grounded and understood to the word, that power will overwhelm them and it will become that they begin to bring that spiritual aspect under subjection to the word, under subjection to the flesh, rather than bringing that flesh under subjection to the word. We see it. We're living in a society where people would do anything to have their way. And they're right. My question, are you one of those people? Are you trying to build your house on unrighteousness? Well, you, do you support people who you know walking in unrighteousness? Because in essence, you're saying that's who you really are. You know, as a pastor, I can't let this slide to talk to you because God is talking to me. It says here, this is how God did deal with him. He, it says here, he judged the cause of the poor and needy. This is what righteous people do. Then it was well with him. He did what was right. He first he put them. He was he was in charge. He became the servant to those who had need, those who he know were lacking, you know. And because he looked after them more than himself, it went well with him. He says here, went well with them. And was not this to know me? Was not this to know me? Said the Lord. That's how God is. God said supply all your needs according to his riches and glory through Christ Jesus. He will supply them. But it's based on your trust and your faith in him. Give and men should give unto you. Press down, shake it together and run it over. The scripture says. Why? Because you're walking in righteousness. You're giving in righteousness. You're just not giving of your of what your, your what you may call your wealth. You're giving of yourself. There are people who do not have a lot of money, but they give of themselves. And because they give of themselves, that's what people need at certain times. Just that, that hearing ear, that, that, that drive to the store, you know, those little valuable things. That, that, that meal, that extra meal sometimes, but they don't have it. See, that's righteousness. Verse 17 says, but thine eyes and thine heart are not 
for thy covetedness. But thy eyes and thy heart are not or are not but for thy covetedness. Talk about the flesh. The more you see, the more you want. And for to shed innocent blood and for oppression and for violence to do it. Oh, there are people with histories of getting ahead and causing the blood of others. Are you one of those people? Are you one of those people? It's all about me. I want what I want when I want it, and I don't care who I hurt to get it. That's oppression. Believers, we're the servants. Believers, we're the true disciples of God. Believers, we're the ones in right standing with God. We're the ones that he's ordained to carry out his will here on earth. Not for our own glory, but for his glory through us. That's what it's all about. He says here, at, at, at verse 17 in Amplified, But your eyes and your hearts are only for covetousness and dishonest gain, for shedding innocent blood, for oppression and doing violence. People don't care who they have to walk on, what they have to do. We've got gangs killing people in the street because of their territory to sell drugs or to uh, the prostitute ladies or prostitute men or just to do wrong. And they will kill if you come in their territory. That's the flesh. That's unrighteousness. So they can get gain. They don't care if, you, if you're blocking that gain and stopping the gain. They will do anything to do to get you out the way. Is that your attitude towards things? Would you step over others to get what you want when you want? This right versus righteousness, brothers and sisters, this is not by chance God is having me to teach this now, doing these times, even in our own country right now. No. There are pastors who've gotten away from this word of righteousness and become self-serving. There are pastors who will use their congregation just to say they have the biggest church of facilities. They're, they're pastors who have got God's will, not only for their life, but for the lives of others. And not realizing one day they want to give account for that. You see, the whole much is given, much is also required. And the requirement they laid out specifically by God. The greatest of you will become the servant of who? My people. He goes over here in the 18th verse. Therefore, thus said the Lord concerning Jehoiakim, the son of Josiah, king of Judah, they shall not lament for him, saying, Oh, my brother, or Oh, my sister, they shall not lament for him, saying, Oh, Lord, oh, 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 his glory. Jehoiakim, he, he, he was, a, he was a, a, a king that was honored by God, that went his own way. Forgot what he's supposed to be doing for God and started trying to get others to do what God told him to do for him. God said, I want so much of your silver. He went and took silver from other people to give to God and said, here, not touching his own. And God said, in the end, he's going to pay at the very time when I take you out, and God took him out, there ain't nobody that's going to be around crying for you or pitying you. Oh, we miss him. Oh, we wish he was there. Let me tell you something. When you do wrong, when you do wrong, the righteous, and you're taking out, the righteous rejoice. Because now they don't have that darkness over them anymore. And you have a lot of people, they don't know they're walking in darkness. That's why God said, you ought to be with your lips, but your heart is still far from me. You know, sometimes we can see people in darkness and not tell them, brother, that, that's, you're not going the right path. You know, you're in a state of unrighteousness. Therefore, nothing good can come of it. But we go along with it. To, to say nothing for people who are doing wrong, it's really saying, I agree. Well, even though you say, well, no, I don't agree with that. Well, not to say anything and stand up saying you agree. Your silence is a state of agreement. The righteous, and I 
share that with you last week. The righteous, that bold is lying. It's the wicked that flee. But no man pursue it. Let me, let me read over this chapter. He said, He shall be buried with the burial of an ass, drawn and cast forth beyond the gates of Jerusalem. Let me read both of these in the Amplified. It says, Therefore thus said the Lord concerning Jehoiakim, son of Josiah, king of Judah, relatives shall not lament for him. You know, they're not going to cry over him, saying, Oh, my brother, oh, my sister, how great our loss. Subjects shall not lament for him, saying, Oh, my Lord, oh, his majesty, oh, how great was his glory. None of them, they're going to say it because he was horrible. They're going to say, no, he shall be buried with the burial of a donkey. We said ass, but a donkey. That's kind of burial. It's a burial. It was a light burial, light covering. They allowed the vultures to pick him up. They just threw a little dirt on the vultures just to keep the smell down where the dope vultures can do their thing. And it said, dragged out and cast forth beyond the gates of Jerusalem. Now, this is the king. You've got people right now who saw so called power. Uh, thinking their power, even some pastors, you know, you know, all pastors are not filled with the Holy Spirit, even though they carry the titles. That's why he said many are called, but few are chosen. And you said, Pastor, why are you coming this way? Because I'm have to tell the truth. Who gonna give hell account if I don't tell you the truth? God's gonna hold me accountable. And once you know the truth, the truth should make you free. Free from what? Free from being pulled in. Free from being hoodwinked. Free from allowing yourself to be in because of others' desire, and if you find yourself caught in their desires, and nigga, you know, you're pulling away from God. That's why I'm sharing this with you, even with yourself. It says here, verse 20, Go up to Lebanon and cry, and lift up thy voice in Basham, and cry from the passage, for all thy lovers are destroyed. In other words, those people who ran with you, those people who you call your friend, they gone. That you were so bad, they didn't even want to stick around. Hmm, that sounds familiar today, doesn't it, in politics? You see, when people know you're wrong and go along with you for their own position, for their own gain, they're not going to say a thing. They become your friend. But when everybody else throw down on you and they realize that the fall is coming, they will scatter. The righteous are bold as lions. It's the wicked that flee when no man pursues. Verse 21, I spake unto thee in thy prosperity. But thou said I would not hear now. It's amazing. <laughs> God, in the early days of the king and, and his nation, he prospered. He brought things because they were humble in their beginnings. But yet and still, once they got what they want, from God, they felt they didn't need God anymore because they didn't begin to, how the kids say, show their butts. They begin to do things on their own that know was contrary to God's word and God's lifestyle. They begin to move from God's righteousness into their own fleshly unrighteousness. And it created a lot of problems. It brought out the flesh not no longer being subjection, under subjection to God's word. You gotta ask yourself. Have you allowed your, your semi-prosperity to get you away from what got you there? Have your eyes become bigger than your pocketbook? You see, there comes a point in life that you've got to choose this day who you're going to serve. And you serve it based on your attitude. One of the things I, I, I say in my prayers on a day-to-day -day basis, Father, I'm thankful and I'm grateful. Thankful and I'm grateful. When the last time you told God in the midst of just having a morsel piece of bread or just having enough money to pay off all your bills, that Father, I'm grateful. I'm thankful that you allowed me to have food in the refrigerator and allowed me to pay all my bills. In the natural, it may be true that I don't physically see the money in my pocket, but the truth is I'm not broke. Why? Because I've got you. And every time I need something, you always are there to supply my needs according to your riches and glory. Through the anointed Christ Jesus, who I honor because you sit in for me.
that should be your attitude. Let me, let me read on this thing here. It says, verse 21, I speak unto thee in that prosperity, but thou said, I will not hear. This have been thy manner from thy youth, that thou obeyest not my voice. Are you one of these right here? It says, the wind shall eat up all thy pastors. Oh my goodness. What do you mean that pastor? The one who got you here, the one who's supposed to be your spiritual leaders, but just go along with your mess so they can still gain what they want when they want from you. Being a partaker of your evil doing and your unrighteousness. See, they know how to scatter when the bottom falls out. It says here, the wind shall eat up all thy pastors and thy lovers, and confound it all, and confound it for all thy wickedness. They, they're gonna scatter. They will scatter. They will let you know that you know. I can only go with you so far, but now it's been exposed. They might be the ones who threw the knife and hide and hit the hand, but yet and still, God knows to scatter them. And now you're all by yourself. It says here, verse 23, O oh, inhabitants of Lebanon, that makest thy nest in cedars, how gracious shall thou be when pains come upon thee. The pain as of a woman in travail. In other words, the bottom about to fall out. And you're about to get your just reward. Verse 24, as I live, said the Lord, though Kaniah, the son Jehoiakim, king of Judah, were in the signet upon my, my right hand, yet would I pluck thee thence. If, if you want to know about my Jehoiakim, because I'm, I'm bringing this name out because he, he was somebody who God initially trusted, but God knew about his ways and hoped that he would change. This is over in the book of 2 Kings. And you will find that, that God did everything to make him stay in, in line with his word, to, to help him because of stuff he used to ask for God, God provided. And yet, as soon as he received that, as soon as he got that, he began to go into his own righteousness. In other words, he began to serve himself and have others serve him rather than serve the one who got him there, the one who put him on top, the one that he provided for him to get him where he was. The attitude. See, God gives us a chance to do what's righteous. But it's up to us to walk in that righteousness. This is why he tells us to guard our heart. Guard your heart. Some of us, we think we've arrived. You're not there yet. If your heart's not right, you can never forget where you came from because where you came from is going to be a heritage of where God has taken you. Let, let me read on here. It says, verse 23, O oh, inhabitants of Lebanon, that maketh thy nest in the cedars, how gracious shall thou be when pains come upon thee, the pain of as a woman in the other words, when the bottom falls out. How, how are you going to, what's going to happen then? It says here, verse 24, As I live, said the Lord, as I live, said the Lord, though Conan the son of Jehoiakim, king of Judah, were the signet upon my right hand, yet would I pluck thee thence. In other words, this man, this was somebody who I took care of, who, who supposed to have been uh, people looking at him would be looking at me, but yet and still, I will show you how I would even take care of those who betray me. He says here, verse 25, And I will give thee into the hand of them that seek thy life, into the hand of them who face thou fearest, even into the hand of Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, and into the hand of the Shadian. These were ruthless people during that time. You know the story about me, Chad, Chad, right a minute ago. They, these were ruthless leaders at that time who were self-centered, self-serving, and you didn't want to cross their paths. You know, and, and God said, look here, I, I protect you, but you know, I'll just turn you over to them right now. Since you've arrived, since you're doing everything opposite of what I've asked, what I've asked you to do, since I bless you and you're still you walking away from me, that's what would happen. And I'm talking about believers right now. Who got you there can keep you there. But it's based on you following the covenant that he said. God watches over his word to perform it. Right versus righteousness. He says here. Verse 26. And I will cast thee out. And thy mother that bare thee into another country. 
where you were not born, there shall you die. You was king of this land, and I'm going to take you out the land that I gave you and put you and your family in another land, and you're going to die there. But nobody knows you or care about you. Your greatness, your self-greatness is going to be your downfall. He goes on, he says, verse 27, But to the land whereunto thy desire to return, thither shall they not return. He won't let you go back home. Is this man, Cornell, a desperate, to despise, broken item? Is he a vessel wherein is no pleasure? Wherefore, Father, I cast out. He and his seed are cast into a land which they know not. Not only him, but his seed. He scattered his seed. Look at verse 29. O earth, 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 hear the word of the Lord. Thus saith the Lord, write ye this man, Childless, a man that shall not prosper in his days, for no man of his seed shall prosper, sitting upon the throne of David and ruling any more in Judah. In other words, I'm casting not only you out, I'm casting your seeds out. Let me read that from the Amplified here. Thus said the Lord, verse 30. Thus said the Lord, write this man, Kaniah. Down is childless, a man who shall not prosper in his days, for no man of his offspring shall succeed in sitting upon the throne of David and ruling any more in Judah. In other words, he not only you only knocked yourself out, you put a generation curse on your people. You now sometimes we can do that because if you're the one training up a child in the way she go, then when he go he won't depart from him but you've been training them up in wicked ways, why would God bless, not only not bless you, but bless them if they take it on your type of ways? Brothers and sisters, I'm trying to close with this, but but let me give you a couple of verses here as I kind of, kind of close with right versus righteousness. And the question, the subtitle was, how are you building your house? Talk about you. This, this house we live in here. The future not only for us, but for our kids. How are you building your house? Is your house full of wickedness? Or is it a house of peace? Does all your family members within your household, do they serve God? Or are they serving themselves? It begins with you being the head. Be it male or female. One of the things that I talked about last week, it dealt with God. Turn to Matthew 6 chapter. We're closing out with this right here. Matthew 6. Verse 33. Matthew 6. 33. I can begin at verse 31, and it's about your flesh and the thing that you desire for your flesh. You read on down here. Starting at verse, and I, let me just take the verse 35 just to be just to be righteous with you here. It says, Therefore I say unto you, take no thought for your life. That's what he says here. What you should eat or what you should drink. We're talking about this. No, yet for your body. What you should put on is not the life more than meat and the body than real. Behold, the fowls of the air, for they sow not, neither do they reap, nor gather into bond. Yet your heavenly Father feed of them. Are you not much better than that? Verse 27, this is Jesus talking now. What do you by taking thought? Because we're always thinking right here now. Can hold add one cubit? Unto his stature. Can you think yourself up a couple of inches? If you five, nine, or five, ten, can you think yourself up to six feet? No. God can't do it for you. It says here, verse 27, What did you take in thought can add one cubit unto his stature? Verse 28, And why take ye thought for railmen? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. 
They toil not, neither do they spin. And yet I say unto you that even Solomon in all glory was not arrayed like one of these. In other words, we see some of the beautiful flowers out there. They may, they may seem bad in the one of God, bring them back into it. We call them annuals, you know. And they come back even better than before. He goes on, he says here, Wherefore, if God so clothed the grass of the field, which today is, and tomorrow is cast into the, into the oven, shall he not much more clothe ye, O ye of little faith? Verse 31, Therefore take no thought, saying, What shall we eat, or what shall we drink? Or wherewithal shall we be clothed? For all these things, verse 32, and I land in your Bible, for all these things do the Gentiles seek, for your heavenly Father knoweth that ye have need of all these things. Even before you ask him, even before it comes up, God knows you're going to need this stuff, and he'll provide. He said, verse 33, but seek ye first the kingdom of God, and his, here's this word again, his right, not your right, his righteousness. And all these things shall be added unto you. Take therefore no thought for tomorrow, for the morrow should take thought for the things of itself. In other words, when the morrow get here, there'll be some other stuff. It's going to handle itself. You, you, you just enjoy the day what I'm giving you right now. Sufficient unto the day is the evil thereof. Psalms 37. Psalm 37. Closing out here now. Psalms 37. David talking to us. Psalms 37, 37 division of Psalms. Let, let, let's, let's start at verse 21. 37 division of Psalms. Verse 2. Let, let's, you know, I, I could start verse 1 through now, but I'm not going to start there. I want you to read that. You know, it stays comes off in verse in first very first. Verse in chapter 37 says, Fret not thyself because of evildoers, neither be thou envious against the workers of any other. Don't worry about what others think they're trying to do to you or, or, or what you're supposed to be doing to others because God's going, God has your back. This battle is not yours but the Lord. He says here, For they shall soon be cut down, look at verse 2, like the grass and wither in the green. Verse 3 says, Trust in the Lord and do good. So shalt thou dwell in the land and verily thou shalt be Fed. Verse 4, hold on to this one. Delight thyself in the Lord, and he shall give thee the desires of thy heart. Commit thy way unto the Lord. Trust also in him, and he shall bring it to pass what your desires. And he shall bring forth the righteousness. Here it is. Bring forth thy righteousness as the light and that judgment as the noonday. Verse 7 says, Rest in the Lord and wait patiently. We Too many impatient people out there. God's not moving fast enough. Rest in the Lord and wait patiently for him. Fret not thyself because of him who prospers in his way, because of the man who bringeth wicked devices to pass. Verse 8, it says, Cease from anger and forsake wrath. Fret not thyself in any wise to do evil. For evildoers shall be cut off. But those that wait upon the Lord shall inherit the earth. Drop down to verse 21. Drop down to verse 21. Trying to close out here. It says, The wicked borrow and payeth not again. But the righteous show mercy and give them. Don't worry about what people are not doing for you. Do for them in spite of. Let them be a blessing to you, and you in turn be a blessing to them. Verse 22 says, For such as be blessed of him shall inherit the earth, and they shall be cursed of him shall be cut off. It says, The steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord, and he delighteth in his way. Verse 24, Though he shall fall, he shall not be utterly Cast down. Mm. For the Lord upholdeth him with his hand. David says, I have been young and now I'm old. Yet have I not seen the righteous forsaken, nor his seed begging bread. Brother, 
brothers and sisters, I'm about to close you with that right there. Because in the end, it's, it boils down to who you trust. Do you trust more in yourself or in the words of God? That's where our blessings come from. That's where our life should be focused on. That's where the love of God should emanate from each and every one of us. When we start talking about rights versus righteousness, it's a gamut of things we can cover. And I know I'm in overtime right now with you, but you need to hear this. You need to hold on this. You need to stand on this. David said he was once young, but now he's old. But he has yet seen the righteous forsaken or his seed begging bread. Pass on something to your family, the love of God. Don't be one of the ones who, when you go, people, they don't cry. They rejoice. Let your legacy be one of righteousness. Not of evil doing. Not of self-service or self being self-centered. Let the Lord, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob, be the spiritual Lord in which people remember you by. Let's pray. Father, right now, in the name of Jesus, we come before you right now as submissive servants right now. As men and women, Father God, who realize that we can do nothing of ourselves, that every good and perfect gift comes from above, from the Father of light. Help us to realize, Father God, as servants in your kingdom, Father God, we're also kings, princesses, queens, and princes in your kingdom also, Father, because we're now children of the Most High God. Help us, Father God, to stay in that humble position, that submissive position, that giving position, Father. Understand that everything works together for the good, for those who love you and are called according to your purpose. Father, I thank you today for each and every person right now under the sound of your voice coming through me, Father. That your love emanates stronger than the evil that's trying to beset each and every one of us, Father. Help us to let the light always shine. Help us to not let darkness have any place in our lives. Lord, we praise you, Sadie. We thank you, Father. Because, Lord, even when we go in place, we want to praise your name. We want to give the, the devil notice that it's you who we serve and not him. We want to let him know that the light that you have is a light that's always spurred. 24-7. That darkness has no place, no place, no place in our life. Father, we thank you for this opportunity because we know you're watching over your word right now inside of us. And because your word is inside of us, Lord, you're going to allow it to do the job you see it out to do in the lives of your people. Bless us. Guide us. Provide for us. That's the state of righteousness that what it provides for us, Father. And we thank you, Father. We thank you in advance for the victory, the victory, the victory. We have with you in you and through you this day. In Jesus' name we pray. Let the church say, Amen.